Hi everyone, in this video, we're gonna be talking all about these 2022 AP European History Free Response questions. I'm John from Marco Learning. In just a minute, we're gonna be joined by Tom Ritchie, who is an expert in all things AP Euro, knows the exam very well, both as a teacher, as a YouTuber, as a reader, as somebody who's been watching this exam evolve over recent years. I wanna share with you two things. The first is our article. This is an article we're gonna be adapting all through the year. There's the painting from it. Um, and that links to this video, as well as the questions, as well as the work that Tom Ritchie's doing on his site to break this down with samples and commentary. So here's what we're gonna start with though, um, as like, the breaking news from a week ago is these are the AP European history free response questions. Remember, we will not have access to those multiple choice questions um, because that's just not how this works every year. We always get this. And then after the exams are graded in June and released in July, we're gonna see student samples and commentary. But so far we have these SAQs that Tom's gonna guide us through, including this painting. Um, this DBQ on the English Civil War, which starts here. And then finally, the three LEQs or long essay questions. So remember, the AP European history exam has a multiple choice section that we can't see. It has a free response section that we can see. And the College Board has released this for us to discuss. After 48 hours have passed, we're free to discuss the exam. So if you're new to our channel, by the way, we have resources in more than a dozen AP subjects and, and resources for college admissions, SAT and ACT. So definitely subscribe to our channel. And if you're watching this after we have posted the recording of it, post your comments in the comment section, your questions, we're happy to answer them for you. This was an interesting exam. There were some twists and turns we weren't expecting and some other things that looked very uh, typical. So here to guide us through this is Tom Ritchie. If you haven't subscribed to his channel on YouTube, definitely check it out. His mega playlist is amazing for AP Euro. Tom, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay, John. Glad to have the exam out of the way and you know, also with the exam out of the way, y'all have to excuse me if it uh, looks like, you know, why are his cheeks so red? Uh, you know, I went out and got a little bit of a sunburn now that we're, uh, you know, now that we're finished with the exam, I actually got outside and I'm getting a life and all of that, uh, all of that kind of stuff here. So, uh, you know, just good to have that out of the way, but I'm glad to come over here and be able to discuss this a little bit. Great. And Tom, one thing I'm going to encourage everyone to do throughout this whole stream is talk to Tom. He's looking at the chat and we want to know what questions you have and also what parts of the exam surprised you, you didn't feel prepared for, what you went, um, what you did well for. There is, of course, a lag here a little bit with our with our live stream, but we're going to answer those questions as we go through the session. So definitely um, post all of your questions and comments there. So, Tom, I'll join everyone in the chat and turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, John. And I see some great things here. Executive X. OK, just said Tom. So I'm saying Executive X. OK. And so as far as that uh, as that goes, we see a lot of different uh, approaches to the DBQ. And I think that that's one of those things. I noted that there were a lot. Let's go ahead and start with the DBQ because, you know, we we see that that's the biggest task in the free response. And, uh, you know, so we want to go ahead and go in there. Let's go ahead and see what we've got. So with this, we can go to Marco Learning's page here that is linkable in the video description. So let's go ahead and look at the AP European History DBQ. So now this is basically, I do, I do intend to update this file. So this is something that if you're watching this later, you may see something updated. So far, the only thing that I've got is the essay that I wrote. Okay, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, I've got the essay that I wrote here, um, and that is, uh, you know, that's there. And what I did on here, now I used uh, all of the documents. Is my thesis was, uh, you know, that the English Civil War was primarily a political war caused by a power struggle between the king and Parliament. However, religious differences were used and amplified in order to motivate people to support one side or the other. Those who were reluctant to get involved believed it was more of a conflict between two factions than a holy war. Now, one thing that I want to note here, and sometimes I do this on purpose, yes, this is a three-sentence thesis statement. The rubric says one or more sentences in one place, okay? So people ask, can I write two sentences? Can I write three sentences? Yes, if you've got uh, three three body paragraphs and you want to write three sentences, that is totally okay. So you see here where I've got here religious documents and then I've got political documents and then I've got 
caught in the middle. Okay, these two, there were two that just seemed to be caught in the middle. There were a lot, a couple of things I noticed about the DBQ. First of all, there were a lot of documents that could go either way. They, they were setting it up. Somebody was noting Green Saber, I believe, was noting that, okay, I just basically found religion in the ones I could, and I used that. That is, that's an approach. Um, that's certainly an approach. Now, a couple of things that I would note here about, uh, you know, about the way that what I saw here was a lot of flex documents. Now, also, y'all tell me what y'all are thinking on this as well, because I felt like on this one, if you knew about the English Civil War, it was easy to make an argument. Um, on this one, I felt like if you knew nothing about the English Civil War or very, very little, you were going to have a hard time. And I think that sometimes the English Civil War gets, and, and y'all let me know in the in the chat if this was your AP Euro course, that perhaps the Glorious Revolution ends up getting a bit more airtime in an AP Euro class than the English Civil War. So if the more you knew about the English Civil War, I think the better off you were going to be because the documents seem to me very, very randomly placed. Another thing I noticed is point of view analysis was very important. There were some of these documents that the best thing you could do was analyze a point of view. For example, there was one document where it was, let's see here, and these links are, um, you have to, I'm having to right click and note to open them in new text. Have. Okay, so as far as that goes, let's see. So here we've got the link uh, to that. And so, for example, there's one document written by the guy's wife. And so when you're thinking about that, uh, that when you've got a document written by the guy's wife, we would know this is not him writing that. Okay, so on one hand, this is not him writing. And so therefore, we can't think about this verbatim as his opinion. Um, but on the other side, you could have noted that it's his wife writing it. This is someone who should have known, okay? This is someone who should have known him very, very well, okay? And so as far as that, uh, as that goes, that, uh, you know, this is something where that old school, like old AP Euro exam before 2016, uh, you know, this point of view analysis is very important. Now, there are some of them like, you know, you've got document two, I used historical context. Okay, so for that one, because the Anabaptists are actually in the course and exam description. Okay, so when we see here the Anabaptists, Okay, so we see here that we see that religious radicals, including the Anabaptists, and then we see here um, the Anabaptists refused to recognize the subordination of the church to the secular state. And that's, of course, what comes out in this document. This document is pretty much saying what the course and exam description already says. So what I did with this one is I used um, some historical situations slash small c context, whatever we're calling it. And this is something that I said, OK, this is consistent with Anabaptists. Um, you know, believing in the complete separation of church and state. Okay, so I said, this is not just a group of Anabaptists. Now, with that, I noted, though, that Anabaptists are being persecuted, but I noted this is not causing the war. OK, the persecution of Anabaptists is not really what's causing the war, that really the big, uh, you know, the big group that's in Parliament, these are the Puritans and separatists, these Calvinist um, Christians. OK, so with that, I noted, OK, Anabaptists are getting persecuted, but that's not really what is starting this thing. And so with that, uh, you know, I think that point of view analysis is very important. I feel like and again, let's see what y'all said in the chat here. I feel like it was more important to know the topic. Okay. Oh, actually, we've got something here. Knew a lot about the English Civil War. Okay. So a lot of y'all, the majority of you said that you did not feel like you knew a lot about the English Civil War. Um, so with that, um, and again, one thing I want to note. Yeah. So Green Saber, I use Divine Right of Kings for my contextualization. Okay. So my overall contextualization, I use the Divine Right of Kings. Um, Taj, now the Test Act is something that uh, the Test Act came out during the restoration, but now I don't think they're going to get too nitpicky with that, okay? I think that that's going to be, uh, if you use the Test Act, I think that they're going to let that slide a little bit, um, even though technically that's going to be outside. Now, it could definitely be context, but I think they'll probably, they may let that slide. As, I don't know, though. It's, it's going to be a little iffy, but I, if, if it doesn't go to outside evidence, 
it will contribute to historical context, okay? Because it is technically outside of this. Um, acceptable sources for outside evidence. I think there are several of them. Like, you know, now the 30 years war, that's a great example of what I would call horizontal context. So a lot of times I use like vertical context, which would mean using something that is from another period. But horizontal context, the 30 years war, I think that this would be something that, okay, Alex, uh, let's go ahead. We're going to delete that. We're going to delete that comment. We're going, yeah, go ahead. I would retract that comment, Alex, um, because that's not a released item. Okay, so let's be careful um, that we're only discussing released items um, in the chat. Okay, so, uh, so be very, very careful about that. Yes, very good, Alex. We're only discussing released items, the only DBQ that has been released by the College Board is the one on the English Civil War. Um, so with that, now, I feel like the uh, the visual source was very, very easy to interpret. It was it was like really kind of now part of that was, did you know what the Magna Carta was? Can we get another question there in the chat? Um, how many people knew what the know what the Magna Carta is? OK, so that's something that uh, we can see here. If you go out of a hundred year period in context, Ellie, um, contextualization does not have to be nearby. Uh, actually, the term that I use is the proximity relevance axis, okay? The proximity relevance axis, meaning that the more relevant it is, then the more, so the more relevant it is, then the farther away you can go. So if there's something that, you know, for example, if you go, if you're arguing religious and you go back to Martin Luther, 1517, okay? So this is something, I mean, Martin Luther can be nailing those 95 theses to the church door and you've got historical context, okay? Because if it is a religious war, you could go into the Reformation. All right, come on, let's be nice to Alex. We all love Alex, okay? Y'all go ahead and uh, go ahead and say that you love Alex in the chat. All right, so with that, the French Revolution, yes, um, the French Revolution, that would be, now, um, remember, complex understanding is not earned by one thing. You don't earn complex understanding. Oh, here's my complex understanding. The entire essay is complex understanding. So what I would say there, if you brought in the French Revolution and the radicalization thereof, then it would contribute to the complex understanding point. I say that that it would definitely contribute because we've seen questions where they were where they were doing that, okay? So so with that um work for a thesis in support of religion, I think, yeah, context. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. There are a lot of ways that we can learn context. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, and if you're finding this helpful, go ahead and put a like um, on this. Just uh, give it a like. I just went ahead and gave it a like. Uh, so go ahead and do that. And so going from there, let's go ahead. We've got the DBQ that we've gone over. Now let's go over the SAQs. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share the screen again here. All right, so let's go to the AP Euro SAQs here. And what I've done here is I've got some sample responses. And some of these, what I've done is I've put something, I've got a system here that I introduce where the blue is an answer I would call insufficient, the purple likely sufficient, and then the gold above and beyond. OK, and so that's something here that I would say that, for example, when we think about a change resulting from secularization. OK, so we see secularization in the Enlightenment um, between 1750, 1850 was the repeal of the Test Acts in Britain. The Test Acts passed near the time of the Glorious Revolution mandated that people in government positions be members of the Anglican Church. Now, between what's in the blue and the purple, I think it's likely sufficient. But I always train students, keep going. It's kind of like your cross country or track coach. They don't tell you like you get to the finish line, stop. They tell you get to the finish line, keep going. So I always tell people when they're taking these exams, if you feel like you've written enough, write one more sentence with specific stuff in it. How specific, Richie? 
how specific can it be? Okay, and be as specific as possible. Um, a lot of y'all will be taking AP US history next year. So make sure you're not only um, subscribed to Marco Learning's YouTube channel, but you're also following Marco Learning on Instagram at Marco Learning. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Tom Ritchie. Okay, so that's something that we can see there. So with this, um, you know, we see some things here. Now, I believe that the civil con now, A, I feel like the author's argument was very easy to understand, uh, you know, just almost, uh, you know, just just one of the easiest that I've seen. So B, I feel like the civil constitution of the clergy could have been for either one. That could have been B or C. But I noted the civil constitution of the clergy as something that, um, you know, was inspired by the Enlightenment. Um, so some of these, there are a few things that could probably go into B or C. Now, then, um, yeah, and again, this is not like there's no like college, you know, these are not college board official samples. These are just, you know, when I was looking through it, I'm like, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm thinking when I see these. OK, so these have not been scored by college board readers, but I spent eight years as a reader myself and kind of know my way around uh, the scoring process. And so one thing now, one thing that I thought was interesting too, the visual source, um, when we look at. At, uh, you know, the visual source. Now, one thing that we're going to note here is AP US history um, for their SAQ2 this year. They used a non visual primary source. So I want to call attention. Um, the course and exam description just says all it says is that question two, SAQ2, is primary source analysis. So it doesn't have to be a visual source. Now, one thing that is clear when you look at the color version on Marco Learning's website, when I looked at this, at this picture in color, you can tell that the woman is a widow. I don't think that's quite as clear in the black and white. Now, you could see that she's wearing dark clothes, but in the color photo, it's very evident that this woman is a widow. But one thing that you note here, the attitude toward poverty, um, that, the, that the painter here, the artist, it seems to think that, look, poverty is something we need to do something about. And you can see the way that these are not, a, there's no able-bodied man here. This is a woman with two kids and a baby, okay? And then also this little girl is selling flowers. So you see that she's not there because she's lazy. So the messaging here being that this urban poverty that is existing aside, great prosperity and wealth, that this is something that this is a problem that needs to be dealt with, okay? So that's something that, uh, you know, that you, that you see from there. And then the broader context of the painting, I said the second an industrial revolution. You could have gone into urbanization. Um, there are a lot, you know, there are several things you can note here. And so then what's there, you know, when we think about the late 1800s, early 1900s to address the problems of poverty in, uh, you know, in Europe. So when we're addressing the problems of poverty. Um, what I noted here is the Otto von Bismarck. OK, pushing through wealth, well, welfare state reforms, old age pensions, accident insurance and health insurance. That was something where, uh, you know, we got a little warm water records going over there. If any of y'all heard that Bismarck rap, uh, you know, come straight out of there. So then now y'all let us know, did you choose question three or question four? Question three was about significant cultural or intellectual change during the Renaissance. Um, and then. We see here that, uh, you know, the Western Europe and other parts of the world after 1945. So y'all go ahead and y'all say, did you choose SAQ3 or SAQ4 and go ahead and signify by putting a three or a four in this, uh, you know, so, oh yeah. And actually they've got, we've got polls now that we can, uh, that we can do here. So with that, um, let's go ahead and see, okay, we've got about a 60, 40 split. It looks like between SAQ3 and SAQ4 looks about looks about like 60-40. So, you know, we've got uh, we've got that. And so Russian serfs freedom for which one? Um, you know, I don't see anything. Well, um, let's see. If you're thinking to see, that could be an issue. Okay, so I would say the freedom of the Russian serfs under Alexander II. Um, I think that would be an acceptable response for 2C. Now, one thing that I want to note, there are a couple of uh, concerns about the course and exam description on this exam, because we noticed that 3C, okay, so when we look at 3C, um, you know, it says something about the 
uh, art of the Italian Renaissance and the art of the Protestant Reformation. Now, the art of the Protestant Reformation, this phrase never shows up in the course and exam description. Now, the, the one thing that I think is a little confusing here is, you know, that the Baroque is something that served the interest of the counter or Catholic Reformation. And I think when students see Protestant Reformation, it's something that could kind of get them off the path. Like, does this have to be Protestant art, okay? So I think what they're looking for, you know, they're looking for, uh, you know, the Baroque and mannerism, but also one thing is I was talking to some eight other AP Euro teachers that, you know, what we could be looking at here in terms of Baroque and mannerism, now think, speaking of this art, I forgot, to, you know, I was doing a push right before this and I forgot to have my, you know, European art up here, forgot to change my art better late than never, Let's go ahead and get that uh, get that starry night up there. All right, okay. So so with that, uh, you know, it's a concern that like they're using different terminology than what they've got in the course and exam description. Now, what we can hear in the chat, um, let me know if you uh, felt like, you know, that you were like, wait, what is this? Or if you understood where they were going and you went for, you know, Baroque art or something like that. Um, you know, now also, I think given what they've done here, I think they might, if somebody's comparing Italian Renaissance art or Northern Renaissance art, oh, I love Botticelli's um, the birth of Venus. Okay, that's great. Um, so we can see, yeah, the factory acts, I believe, are the 1840s, but I think that can qualify for, for the mid, like they're not going to be too, um, Taj, I don't, or Tej, I don't think that they're going to be too um, much of sticklers that, oh, that was before 1850. So with that, yeah, I think that uh, what we can see here, that Italian Renaissance art, yeah, when you're thinking about that, you've got the pagan goddess um, there. So, so I think the question was a fair question, but it's still um, something that is separated from the course and exam description. So I actually also use the birth of Venus. Okay. So what I did here is I use the birth of Venus um, while art of the Protestant Reformation was based on modesty with little nudity. Some Protestants, especially Calvinists, destroyed religious art because they believed it was idolatry, whereas Renaissance art pieces filled Catholic churches. Now, that was something that looked to me like it was kind of, uh, you know, just a little bit possibly confusing for students because it's using language that's not in the course and exam description. And so teachers are not being cued like I need to focus on Protestant Reformation art. There's nothing in the course and exam description that tells teachers that this is going to be a major topic. Now, with that, I'm going to question four here. Um, a couple of things that I would note. Now, first of all, I would say here the close relationship with the United States. That's the first thing that occurred to me. The second was decolonization. Now, here's the other one. This is what's, what's interesting about this. This says between Western Europe and other parts of the world, okay? Now, as far as that goes, did anybody say Eastern Europe? Did anybody say, you know, the other part of the world that I'm going to be using is Eastern Europe? Okay. Oh, look at that go. Uh, you, Eugene, you're giving that super chat. We are all getting fives. So this is what I'm kind of uh, interesting here. Uh, you know, all um, Olive Branch Petition uh, looks like you're ready for a push. I would say here that... Um, yeah, let's see. Um, art, let's see. Yeah, I think here, um, this is fine. Like, if you're talking about a Lutheran hymn, um, you know, music, uh, yeah, music is art. So, yeah, I think that, you know, Lutheran hymns and that sort of thing, I think that would be fine. Um, that now, when y'all say one, we've got to think about, uh, y'all got to be a little more specific with that. Um, but with that, I think that, okay, now, now with this, did anybody on question four say, Eastern Europe is your other part of the world, because I think that they're going to have to accept that, because technically, while we may think another part of the world is beyond Europe, the question does not say beyond Europe. So I believe that at the reading, the readers are going to be told that, um, you know, accept Eastern Europe as another part of the world, because technically Western Europe's here, Eastern Europe's there. 
it is another part of the world. So that's one thing that I think is going to get uh, is going to get thrown for a loop there because there are I've heard some AP Euro teacher saying that their students came in on Monday and they asked, "Is Eastern Europe acceptable?" Okay. Now, um, one of the biggest controversies, and again, I don't want to comment too much on this because I want to await some feedback or a statement from the test development committee on this. Um, the course and exam description specifically says that SAQ2, um, SAQ2 is going to be from period one. It's going to be from 1450 to 1648. Let's go ahead and get a poll in the chat. Did you know that the CED says that question two will primarily emphasize content from 1450 to 1648? Did you know that and or were you counting on that? Because this is something that I think a lot of teachers have been doing strategy based on this. Like, you know, I know a lot of your AP Euro teachers that are saying, hey, focus on your Renaissance and Reformation and Age of Exploration, because that is going to be something that, you know, this content is going to be SAQ2. And so with this, there is nothing in our LEQ2. Um, there is nothing in the LEQs, the before 1789. So the LEQs have basically ignored the entire first half of the course. So now another thing, though, that I think that they did to compensate for that is there are no um, LEQs that go beyond World War II. So on one hand, they ignored the, uh, you know, they ignored that part of the, like the whole first half of the course, almost the whole first half, because the French Revolution's like the end of the first half. Now, another thing that we know is two and three are addressing the same period. Like that's in the CED, like two LEQs are not supposed to address the same period. Um, so now one thing, y'all go ahead and put two, three, or four um, for what y'all have got here, which one y'all answered. I think that people are going to gravitate toward number four, the Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, which is going to address the totalitarian thesis, okay? They want a, a significant similarity, um, which goes into similarity and difference, okay? So I think that uh, that the thing that's going to cause the most discussion, um, you know, the thing that's going to cause the most discussion, okay, Green Saber says you were counting on this. Yeah, I think a lot of students and teachers, we read the CED as contractual. And so this is something that I think the College Board, the Test Development Committee, they need to, uh, they need to answer for. Like they need to let us know what was the rationale here and are we supposed to consider the CED dead in the water? Because the two things are that LEQ1 is going to be from, uh, you know, from the first period, the first of the four periods pre-1648. And then two LEQs are not going to come from the same historical period, which we see with LEQ two and three, they're coming from the same historical period. Now, again, though, you notice that there's nothing in the LEQs that's post-World War II, so nobody got punished for not getting past World War II. Like when some people say that my teacher never, my teacher didn't get past World War II, I say, you know what? your teacher did their job. Like if you get through World War II, and I say this for A push or for AP Euro, um, that there's no reason why, so, why a student who wants to pass this exam um, can't read up and watch some videos or whatever they're gonna do um, for, the re you know, for the rest of it. So with that, um, you know, as far as that goes, um, you know, there's going, it, it, there are some points, Green Saber, that could be earned um, if you were writing about only the French Revolution, but other points could not be. Like, you, you wouldn't be able to get the thesis point. You could get contextualization and you could get evidence one. So I would say that you could, um, you could get at least two points. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would say you could write a two out of six point essay that would cover only the French Revolution. OK, I think you could do that. And a two out of six essay will keep you from failing the exam on account of the LEQ. Like if you've got a two out of six, um, you know, that should keep you from failing the exam because of the LEQ. So, yeah, basically how they grade the exam, um, Ina, is 
that uh, it, it is something where they score the exams first. They not on a curve, but they, they have a scale. Like basically for, you know, they calculate points and after the exams are scored, there's a committee that gets together and they cut scores, which basically means that here is the distribution of scores and this committee meets to decide, okay, this, this number and up, that's a five. This number to this number, that's a four. This number, this number, three, two, one, so on. So with that, um, that's what, yeah, so they score the exams first, and then they have the committee get together and say, what's going to be a five, four, three, two, one for this year? So that is something, and again, when y'all when y'all are asking with this work or with that work, that sort of thing there, that can be, uh, you know, that can be there. Now, yes, propaganda, secret police. Yeah, I think uh, a tool, this looks like, you know, I'd have to read the essay, but I think that that is, uh, that's fine. Um, Eugene, no, the, the, the cut scores, that's done after the exams are graded because they have to see how did students do on the exam. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, remember, go ahead and drop a like if this was something that you found helpful, which you did. So go ahead and, and do that for us um, and for yourself, really, because sometimes it just kind of makes you happy to, ah, you know, make sure you're following Marco Learning at Marco Learning on Instagram and my account on Instagram at Tom Ritchie. Um, that's always something that uh, that's always something I think is going to be uh, you know, helpful. Now, of course, POV, that is, uh, that is me. Okay. And again, uh, apologies for, uh, you know, my sunburned face and all of that kind of stuff, but I'm going out. Yeah. Gosh, I mean, this is so funny, but, uh, you know, so funny to see myself there, but remember that, you know, get outside the exams over, go enjoy your summer. And remember Marco learning is going to be here for you next year. If you're going on to a push, remember I'm here for you. I do, uh, I do, uh, you know, help for a push as well. So we're here for you. Have a 